This is Create the Next from Pro CFO Partners, where every week we explore strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help today's businesses put their financial picture in context. Welcome back to Create the Next. I'm Chris Bentliff with Pro CFO Partners, and I have Kathleen Reynolds with us today. We're going to talk about something that I'm personally energized and excited about, which is SaaS, Software as a Service, uh, and tech companies, and how some of the financial aspects um, of those companies can maybe be better understood, things that we can think about as founders or as creators or as uh, executives in these startups. So Kathleen, welcome. And I'm, I, I want to start by digging in on cash flow. I think cash flow is, uh, operates a little bit differently for a SaaS company than otherwise. M- maybe you agree. What do you think we should be keeping in mind right off the bat where cash flow is concerned for a SaaS or a, a tech startup kind of company? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so cash flow is really, it, it harkens back to that that old saying, cash is king. For a startup, it's especially so. They live and die by the dollars that they bring in. Um, it allows them to create the product, especially such with tech startups where they're generally very um, in, intensely heavy in engineering, development expense, uh, and and those you know those types of um, of staffing and outsourced considerations, uh, and cash flow gets eaten up really quickly, especially when you're um, you know you have to lay out for these very expensive resources in order to create your product. So um, when we say cash is king, it's very true. We are basically looking at uh, cash on on almost a daily basis. It depends on. Uh, where you are in the startup uh, maturity, um, but certainly it uh, it is something that has to be uh, managed very carefully and with an eye towards the uh, the runway for the company until they become um, self sustaining from a cash flow perspective. You know, as well as um, all of the other things that pop up in the life of startuphood. Um, and and things like you can't even plan for like a pandemic. Mm. These things are especially um, scary, let's say, for a startup who you know is already um, trying to manage so many things uh, at once in terms of its uh, its burn, you know, its cash flow burn, um, it, raising additional funds from investors, managing to sometimes very tight deadlines depending on uh, the product that they're trying to bring to market. And um, you know whether there are seasonal um, timings that they they need to take advantage of and things like that. So, getting um, having your eye on cash flow and knowing certainly weekly where you are in your um, your burn and how much of a runway the company has months out, weeks out is is critical and and you need to keep on top of that and. That's a CFO's job, really, is to keep on top of that, um, be the resource for um, not just uh, forecasting cash, but also coming up with the different resources for, um, you know, for funding and for um, developing new, um, you know, investor pools, if you will, Mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of thinking outside the box, what other resources are out there, incubators and, you know, angel VCs, or, you know, in, in some cases we have pre-existing networks of um, M&A advisors that operate in these certain spaces and we can go to them and they can make introductions or even invest themselves. So the CFO is sort of the, the, the person who, who looks at that holistically and then provides um, ideas, direction, guidance, to the um, the startup founders and um, and business owners, can you talk to me a little bit about the relationship between um, cash flow, funding, and sales? Because I think that, especially in startups, um, cash flow equals uh, another round of funding, and um, that's interesting and that's important. But when do I start? really thinking about my monthly recurring revenue or my annual uh, yeah. recurring revenue or my per user revenue? When do I start 
concerning myself with attrition or with, uh, you know, the yeah. guys that are showing me that I have more users than I thought, or we're making a nice chunk and change here, but look at how many people are leaving after our two week trial. When do I start thinking about sales versus, oh, we need more funding, we need more funding. And how do I put that in perspective with some of the things you've shared already around my runway? And how do I plan for some of the things that I can plan for where funding certainly creates that? But I'm really curious about this sales component and when that should start to balance out some of that funding. Yeah, that's a it's a great question. And all of these things are really intricately connected with each other. Um, so part of what helps you to, or helps a founder um, to uh, put their arms around when, when to really focus on sales is this idea of having um, a forecasting process that is realistic. Mm-hmm. And it's sometimes that's, that's hard to, uh, to generate because it could be a brand new uh, product that they're putting out there. And specifically I'm talking about, you know, tech startups where, it's it's you know full of innovation and new ideas, um, some many of which could be untested, and so the question then becomes, what are the realistic um, sales goals that you can set for e- for yourselves, um, and and really get detailed about it? And this is where um, CFOs and um, and other advisors, you know, board advisors who have particular industry experience and things like that really come into play to help the founders get really deep into their customer segmentation, their, the target markets that they're trying to reach. What, what if any products out there or industries out there are similar enough that you can glean some um, competitive knowledge or ideas about seasonality of revenue, um, uh, engagement amongst, um, users of a platform, things like that. That's where a CFO can really help, you know, doing that type of competitor analysis, working with the advisors to, um, to, you know, figure out, okay, which are the target companies out there or industries we should be looking at to really put in place realistic sales goals, realistic customer segmentation, um, and, and, and set up a forecast that, you can feel reasonably confident. It's never going to be perfect, but reasonably confident that you can work towards and achieve over a set period of time. And and forecasting, you know, while it sounds like it it could be just this, um, um, uh, you know, dartboard, (laughs) it's really not. When you put a lot of of thought into it and, and get as much real data as you can to help inform your forecasting process, it can really be a useful tool. And that in turn informs when you'll be scaling up your staffing to meet demand, when you'll be scaling up you know, other um, services and things like that that you need to put in place in order to support those sales in the future. And then that whole thing taken together gives you a sense of what, when you will become uh, sustainable from a cash flow perspective, hmm. but it's it's a process and it's a very detailed one um, that you you know you have to try to keep as realistic as possible. But all of these things are very intricately linked, and it's important to you know be able to um, put pen to paper, put numbers down, and really um, you know kick the tires amongst senior management to um to to judge whether or not these forecasts are realistic can be achieved are specific enough um and then from there once you feel confident in that then you can start to see okay when does it look like we'll need additional funding where where will we be in the maturity spectrum of of the startup life right and and where do we see that we will be profitable uh, and and cash flow positive, and so then we'll need less and less of the of the investor funding and be able to sustain the growth of the company organically going forward. I see this as a struggle. Tell me if you agree. Uh, where the forecasting uh, is not given the emphasis that it should be, and so there is not an idea of sort of sunsetting another round of funding and relying now on 
our sales engine. We've we've we may be moving past startup. Instead, it's uh, we can see that we're going to be in a crunch. We better get some funding. Or um, we had an investor come to us, and we think we should take on you know another investor. When is it? Um, maybe you can even share an illustration or, or an experience you've had. But when should I start moving away from? looking at another round of funding is it is that ever uh, is it ever uh, appropriate for me to say no more investors we're only going to now try to like when when do i start to balance that relationship yeah that's a good question and i think the way to answer it is really more along the lines of it's not so much i'm you know we're done with investors but it becomes an an evolution of the type of funding that you'll be taking going forward or using going forward so in, in the life of a startup, you, you start out with the seed funding from friends and family, business associates, things like that. You move on to, you know, angel, VC, et cetera. And then, and this, you know, is again, you know, tied to this forecasting process and, and why it's so important as well and why it needs to be realistic because all of these investors all along will be looking at this yes. and will be kicking the tires and will be saying, I don't know if I want to invest in that next round because I'm not so sure that this is realistic or, you know, it, it becomes um, a tool for, so not just for the, the business owners, but for investors to say, are you being realistic? Does this seem like it, it, it could work? Um, and, and it becomes, a, you know, a real discussion then between investors and, and founders. And then the question becomes, um, so if, if you've gotten to the point, let's say, where you have become cash flow positive, the question then becomes, okay, what's the next step in terms of growth? Yeah. And that is what helps to um, inform your decision about the type of funding flexibility you're going to need. So you may be moving on at that point and not dealing so much with the VCs and et cetera, but moving on to, um, you might even go public. There are lots of companies that go straight from, um, you know, seed rounds to going public. They skip a series A and go right, you know, go right into that. And it's become easier nowadays with the SPACs, um, these, these special purpose acquisition corporations, they're called. And um, they basically skirt a lot of the regulatory requirements that a typical IPO has. But it's become a, a much more popular vehicle for startups, you know, because it allows them to go directly to the public. Um, and it's, it's, it's buyer beware in a way, because um, while it allows these founders to really reach more um, of a crowdfunding type concept, right? Um, the investors themselves really have to um, know that they're getting into a speculative um, investment. But it, it's another, um, another funding you know, alternative in, uh, to an IPO, right? It's basically going public, but without the, the, all of the regulatory uh, requirements. Um, but it is the path, right? And, and each company's path may look a little bit different. It really depends on how your actual uh, sales experience goes, um, and and you have to you have to use your sales uh, forecast as as an organic living um, model because as you learn from your your sales process, we'll we'll be updating it and and saying okay, well we've learned from that. We thought we were going to do well, for example, in um, you know, second quarter. Turns out that's not the case. Really, it's more like a third quarter type seasonality. So you you use this forecast and you you make it more and more accurate over time as you get that experience um, being out in the market, selling your product and, and that sort of thing. Now, some of what you're sharing is, I think, really um, insightful as a, a young startup or a tech founder. And we're seeing companies that are, you know, the beacons, we're seeing the Amazons, we're seeing the Teslas who are focusing less on profitability, 
even to the investors, and they're focusing more on reach, on market share, on market dominance. Do you have an opinion about some of this? Uh, and, and we're not all going to create Teslas and Amazons, but I think sometimes uh, even our modest, you know, we've got a really great little app that we're working on, but in our minds, we want to create a huge reach so that we've got a really clear exit strategy and we get bought up before we even get to a place where we've thought about profitability before we're even turning over uh, a sales engine that makes sense. Do you have a, a point of view on any of that? Do you have some perspective? I'm especially thinking about a listener out there who we want them to avoid a mistake or to avoid a pitfall or to think if there's one thing you could do, it would be this. And that's the smartest thing you could do would be this. I think one of the things you've shared is engage a CFO who can help you pave the way on some of this and who can think clearly about this. That might not be your skill set. But just what's some advice you have around some of these things that we see other companies doing that may be right for us, but may not be right for us? I think you raise a really good point. The 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 only exit doesn't have to be going public. You could be bought out by a competitor or a complementary uh, company um, because your concept, you've proved your concept. Um, so it could be that you get to the point um, as, a, as, as a business, as a startup, where you have proof of concept. You've, you've also shown that scalability is very real for whatever your product is. And you've attracted then the attention of you know, an Amazon type um, uh, organization that uh, is looking for perhaps um, an additional uh, service in its array of services and your, you know, your company happens to, to fit the bill. So yeah, I think that that is a very real possibility, um, but I think it still goes back to this concept of you still have to have a proven approach. Mm -hmm. You still have to, you may not be profitable yet, but you have to have a proven approach where there is some, there is some demand or stickiness, engagement, of the audience, that the target market that you're going for, and 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 your competitor or your your uh, organization who's looking to complement their you know, their business lines, you've attracted their attention because they see the scalability as well. Um, but it goes back to you still have to have that rigor, if you will, of putting in place um, a pretty uh, detailed approach for assessing the market demand, assessing the engagement of the users. Data is really how you do that, right? So you need to have robust systems that collect the type of data that prove your concept, prove that you have customer engagement, prove that your attrition rate is really that low, you know, you, this, this is where um, a CFO, I think, comes in and is able to say, hey, we need some data around this. We need to be able to, you know, prove this. And, and frankly, anyone who buys you out is going to want to see that too. They're going to want to see the evidence that you are, you know, you, you are growing um, a user base. You do have engagement and there is scalability. And those signs start to come about pretty you know, fairly early um, in the in the process of going to market, you'll have to learn pretty quickly, and you'll see pretty quickly from the data coming in, the sales data, and then the customer usage data, um, how you know whether you have proof of concept or not. And it's at that point where founders need to really consider: okay, is this going as expected? If not, what do we need to do to change our approach? Do we need to pivot? because we're actually seeing engagement more on this element of our service rather than this one. But data is what tells you that. And that's where I think a CFO comes in because we're fairly data driven, um, you know, really relying on financial information, and everything else. But it's sort of the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, where's the data that supports that, that claim that you're making, right? So I think that's where um, a CFO can really, can really help put the rigor Around that um, that process, and you know, help the the founder to uh, to put an approach in place that's that's pretty detailed and um, and you know, a tool that that can be used going forward. Kathleen Reynolds from Pro CFO Partners. Again, our time has flown by. I feel like you've really helped us 
crystallize some what can feel like vague concepts. And I, I especially appreciate some of this uh, advice that you just shared around making sure that, I don't know, some of the basics are actually being applied. We can, we can think so broadly out in the future sometimes that, is this thing working? Do you know it's working? Can you prove it's working? Everybody's going to want to uh, see that that's happening and that's valuable. I hope that you'll come back and spend more time with us. We can dive deeper into a lot of these topics together. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thanks for watching. And a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Visit ProCFOPartners.com for more strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help you put your business's financial picture in context.